Hey guys and welcome to unitycookie.com. My name is Alex Telford and in today's theory lesson we're going to be taking a good look at efficient planning and modular workflow for game environments. So in this theory lesson we're going to be covering what a modular environment is, why we would want to use modular environments, what makes up a modular environment, how to use vertex colors to our advantage, we'll talk about planning our environment, creating our environment, and then we'll go over a few tips for efficiency. So there is a lot to cover here, so if you do get a bit lost within this tutorial, then by all means jump over to unitycookie.com and we'll have all the slides there for you to look at and read over at your own pace. So let's get started. First off, what is a modular environment? Well, a modular environment is an environment built out of reusable textures and models, such as modules. Now these will make use of a texture atlas, which is effectively a group of images all pushed into one image. We use a lot of instancing, so we duplicate our objects keeping the same data, which as a result means we have a very low memory footprint. So this does require more planning, but less production time. And that's because less unique pieces mean less work. So let's take a look at why we would want to use a modular environment. Well, a modular environment is easier to create. You can get more ideas and variations much faster. It uses a lot less resources. And because of that, you can put your time, your polygons, and your texture memory into something more important, such as your characters or your vehicles. So, what actually makes up a modular environment? Well, we've got our texture atlases, and we have our modules. So our modules are effectively just bits and pieces that we use to create our environment, and we've created them from our textures. And when we bring those two together, we get a result. So you can see the result we have here was one that I created in a simple six hour presentation a little while ago. So they're very easy and they don't take very long at all, depending on your environment of course. So let's take a look at using vertex colors to your advantage. So vertex colors, they allow you to tint the texture on a per vertex basis. So you can use this to change one texture into another. For example, you can take concrete, stretch it, paint it to make it wood, or paint it to make it become wallpaper. You can split the vertex color channels to use them individually. For example, you can use the red channel to control saturation, green to control specular intensity, and blue to control bump depth. You can also blend between different textures. For example, you can paint vertex colors to paint damage and dirt onto a road. So let's take a look at some examples. Okay, so I have Blender open here. And as you can see, I have this simple scene. And what we have is just some simple geometry that I can come in and I can paint it however I like. So I can tint it red. I can tint it blue. Maybe not that blue. I can darken it. And I can lighten it. And this is all done through a tileable texture and vertex colors. So you can see, there is the actual geometry that makes it up. And we're simply painting on it. Now that same texture has been applied to everything in this scene. So I can come onto any one of these. And I can paint them. And this is the power of using vertex colors to paint or tint our geometry. Okay, so let's take a look at a more advanced example. What I have here is a simple piece of road that as you can see is just fairly simple, not a lot of geometry, but what we have is some textures blending together. So for this one here, I have a road texture, I have a broken road texture, I have a sandy road texture, and I also have a dirt texture. 
and by using vertex colors we can blend between all of these tileable textures without having to go in and do any complex work. So I can come through and if I just grab a red paint we set this to be mix I can come through and I can paint damage onto this road or I can come through and clean it up of course we can always reduce the strength come through and just paint bits of it on wherever we would need damage and now remember this is only using one channel so far we have a total of four channels or in Blender we are limited to three without the alpha channel so what if I come in and I grab green I can then come in and I can paint in some dusty road or I can come in with white and I can come and just paint in dirt and this is the power of using vertex colors to blend textures let's talk about efficient planning for an environment now this is broken down into two parts first we need to look for research now when you're looking for research make sure you get as much reference images as you can take a look at the mood how does this make you feel what do you like about this environment what do you dislike about this environment and you also want to categorize your research so put your research into folders organize them by types such as models, textures, mood and style this will help you find things later on if something fits into more than one category feel free to duplicate it it certainly helps having you know, duplicated things that you know where you're going to find them rather than looking through them all trying to find that one image that you really liked okay and the next part is analyzing your research so once you've got your research you need to break it down you need to come in and find the forms the repetition you need to start by blocking out the basic primitives that make up the scene uh, what objects are repeated throughout the scene and what objects are unique these are the things you need to look for when you are planning a modular environment which is effectively what modular environments are they are you know, blocks and things that are duplicated throughout the scene and finding where we can use those is definitely a good thing to plan out in the research stage next you want to take a look at the textures you want to see how many textures do you need to make up the scene where can you reuse textures to make various objects can you take a texture and mix it with vertex colors to get another one where do you need to color with vertex colors and where do you need to use vertex colors to blend between two textures these are the things you really do need to ask yourself when you are planning out your environment so let's do a few breakdowns on some research all right so let's start off with this photo of an alleyway by Adam Jenks so what we need to do is we need to look through this and look for some textures we'll start out just by planning the textures at this stage so whereabouts can we find some major textures Let's grab a brush here okay so the first ones that you're going to spot is going to be this concrete texture and the brick texture these are ones that will stand out straight from the get-go now you might also want to come in and say hey look we've got a darker concrete texture here why don't we grab one of them or we've got white brick maybe we need two white brick textures or two brick textures one white one orange no you do not this is where we can say okay we can actually use vertex colors here to get these different results so we can grab this one and we can create that darker one simply by painting it we can create that orange over there by painting it we can grab this one and we can create the white brick over there as well as this yellow brick these are things that we can very very easily do 
just by vertex painting. Okay, so I've already come through and highlighted the major textures. You can see here we have a few different textures. We have rust, metal, we have this white texture up here, we have the brick, the concrete, and I did highlight that blue there, but that is more of a prop, so we won't talk too much about props at this stage. So how much of the scene is actually used by these textures? Well, if I highlight that, there we go. This is all the stuff, although badly drawn, you can see all the stuff that is used by these major textures, which is pretty much the whole scene. You can see I simply haven't gone back any further than that, and that's why it's not highlighted. So what about minor textures? Let's see if we highlight some minor textures here. These are ones we didn't include before, but we might want to include on our atlas. So these are ones that we will simply have take up less space and but they'll still be there for us to use so you can see we have some wooden textures we have these grates or windows sort of white dirty plastic and this matte metal these are some minor textures that you might want to include while planning out your environment and you can see if I turn on the usage that I painted up they've actually used up a fair bit of the scene. And finally, we have decals. Now decals is anything like graffiti, signs, or things that aren't necessarily a texture in themselves, but can be applied to other textures. For example, graffiti can be applied to brick, or can be applied to this asphalt there. That's why we call them decals, because we can stick them on things. So once you've gone through and you have broken down all of the textures in your environment, go through and make a list. So you can see here, the major textures we need, concrete, brick, rust, and rusted paint. Those were the textures I've pointed out as being fairly major in the scene. We then go in and what minor textures do we need? What textures are there that we really want? but we don't necessarily need quite as much texture space for them. And that's where we have the metal, the wood, windows, grates. We could also add in doors and such like that if we have doors in there. And what decals do we need? I can see in this environment we had graffiti, we had some signs and we had some damage. So let's take a look at another example. So right here we have a photo of a medieval alleyway by Irene Stock. I apologise if I've pronounced that wrong. So let's go through the same process again and we'll point out what major textures we need, what minor textures we need and what decals we need. So the first one that stands out for me straight away is these bricks here. So I can see these bricks, they use down here, over here, you know, on this whole building here, and up there as well. So this is a major texture in the scene. Looking for other textures, we can see we have these stones here. Let's use a different colour for this. These stones, which can actually be these stones as well, if you want. So what we can do here is we can grab a texture for the side here, we can scale it down and tile it and we get the texture for here. We have a texture in the background over here. I would consider that a major texture. We have this texture here. So it might seem a bit weird grabbing this orange texture here, but it doesn't necessarily have to be orange. This one here can be a white texture that can be painted with vertex colours to get these different shades. So you can see we have a grey one and a blue one. Or, if you think smartly beforehand, we can remove this one here, and we can grab this concrete texture over here, and we can use that instead. Do bear in mind though it, that if they have different texture properties, such as specularity, that is where we could run into a few issues. Okay, so, that established. See our green ones? Can we come through all here as well, and that works perfectly fine. We also have this 
different texture here and you could choose to include that or not personally I would probably just use this one here and map that one on and that would work perfectly fine okay so now that we've got our major texture sorted let's take a look at minor textures okay so for this let me grab a different color and ones that stand out at me is these textures along here so these textures here I can see that these are used a few places around the scene and it'll be a handy texture to have but because of its size we don't necessarily have to assign so much resolution to it okay we also have these tiles up here now those ones they are quite a good one to have but because we're not going to be close to them we're not unless we're going to get up there on top of the buildings we don't necessarily require to have such detail in that texture other minor details that you could see is we have things like this these textures that are assigned to the pots because I can see that is assigned to the other pots that are just a different shade we have this metal that we can see throughout the scene and we have these grills and that's basically it now these grills could potentially be called a decal I would probably use these as a decal because we would use transparency for that so let's create a new layer here and I'm going to select a nice blue and we'll call this one here a decal okay so moving on with decals we have of course the sign this one over here as well which also has a little thing we have ivy and there's a few more signs throughout the scene so I hope you get the idea that creating you know planning out where we want things is very helpful for creating our texture atlases and creating the scene in general alright so the next example I'm going to be taking a look at is more focused on modeling so we've looked at textures quite a bit now but I want to take a look at modular models so I have a shot here from Angry Bots. Now this is a scene that is bundled with Unity and I want to use this as an example so that you can easily see where things are reused throughout the scene. So we're going to be covering this a little bit more later on but just to briefly touch on it you can see we have these barrels and these barrels you can see throughout the scene we have things like these pipes and see these pipes are used throughout the scene also ignoring the textures here I'm just looking at the shapes and we have other things like the floor panels you can see they are used throughout the scene with different shapes this is where we take our models and we adjust them to fit somewhere else so not worrying about textures we just you know we grab say a vent we stretch it skew it and we make it a different vent or we make it into some kind of you know panel of some sorts and it's just reusing assets through the scene as we model now modular models and reusing the models as you're modeling is two slightly different things I want to touch on this a little bit later on but I just want to get it you know in your head that you know it's not just textures that can be modular so let's move on to one last example for planning in this here I have a concept of a forest by Josh Nixon now I want to use this example because I've heard a few times now that people find environments like this very challenging and I know that these are actually challenging environments because that's why I wanted to use this as an example and we just need to break down how we would actually go about this so for these kind of environments we need to break it down into its modularity so we're going to start off by breaking down the models what models do we actually see in the scene well, first off we have these trees you can see we have a tree there tree there there there's trees everywhere that is a big part of this environment and we only need to create two or three trees and combined with random rotations we can create lots and lots of trees and it's very efficient and very modular so 
modular environments aren't just sci-fi, they aren't just hard surface things. They're anything that can be replicated throughout your scene. So these rocks for example, you can see we would create a bunch of rocks, maybe 10 or 12 different rocks, and stacking them together in different ways allows us to create these sort of sets of rocks, these little formations, and it looks great, it's, it's easy and it looks good, and it doesn't take a lot of effort. Next we see we have foliage. Now foliage is something that I would consider more of a particle instance than a modular technique. However, in its base it is technically a module because we grab these grass blades, these little bushes and brush, broken trees that have fallen down, things like that, we grab them and we duplicate them everywhere as much as we can and yeah it saves on a lot of time and when you break it down to all of these forms you can see what we've got is we have if I just grab a new pen here we have let's say five trees we have maybe 12 rocks so that's good and we have a bunch of grass when we take all of that out of the scene all we are left with is, if I just create a new layer here, here, is this landscape itself. So the actual ground you're walking on. And we all know that creating ground is very, very easy, especially if you're using Blender with the ANT landscape generator. So you would simply create this ground however you wanted and add your modules on top, and it really doesn't take much time at all. So that's my last example for these modular research. Let's uh, continue on with the lesson. So let's talk about different ways of actually going ahead and creating our modular environments. Now the first method is to texture first, model later. And there's a few steps involved for this. We start out by analysing some research of the intended environment, just like we have just done. We then make a list of what textures we need. Then we go ahead, grab all the textures we would like to include, perhaps some in varia variations and such, and we put them in a folder. And then in Photoshop, we go ahead and we create a new document, and we make sure we have the grid set up. I usually like to have my grid set to be every 256 pixels with two or four subdivisions. We then go ahead and place our images in the atlas to make sure that they are aligned to the grid units. We then go through and create our normal and specular maps. So we place our specular map in the alpha channel of the diffuse image. And that way we only have to have one image for our diffuse and it's got the specular with it. So that saves on our texture memory. We then sketch out the perimeters required in the scene as well as any repeated elements. Then you go ahead, block out the scene with some perimeters just to prepare us to get a good idea of visualizing our scene. And that is when we go in and we create our modules from our atlas and create our scene from our modules. Now you will need to go and add in more modules as you go throughout the scene because it is very unlikely you'll get all the modules sorted beforehand. Next, you can add in any finer details and unique objects that would be throughout the scene. Now when I say unique objects, I mean object that is unique in its own, it's its own model and perhaps it has its own texture as well, its own normal maps and that is a unique object. It is not modular in a sense. And here is where we go ahead and we merge our modules needed to create units. Now what I mean by this is, let's say you've built a modular building. So you've made a city, which I have made one of these recently, and you have grabbed bits of wall, bits of um, structure, doors, windows, etc. You've put them together to form these variations of buildings and you can't use that in a game engine. You can't, you know, that um, it will work but a game environment with 100,000 pieces will be very very slow because it's calculate the location of all of those pieces. So what you need to do is merge them together to create units 
and then those units are now your modules so those units of building are now your buildings that are throughout your city next you'll go through and you'll fix any mesh problems that could likely exist now this is very likely they will exist because when you're creating modules you're sort of sticking things together getting the form making this sure they look good then you create these units and you've got to go through and merge bits make sure there's no interpenetration or anything like that now this is a technique that I reckon is actually pretty great for beginners if you're really getting into this uh, modular environment doing this texture first model later really helps you visualize things as you go and helps keep you in on your project uh, creating a game environment where you've you know, you've got a model, no textures, you can't really see what it looks like that really puts off beginners, people who haven't got a lot of work on their portfolio they just, yeah they get bored and as such I reckon you know texture first, model later and it works quite good for actually completing your projects so let's go ahead and we are going to make a texture atlas alright so what we're going to do is create a new file and this one here, I'm just going to make it a 124 by 124 or 1K texture. And just an 8 bit RGB will be fine. So, these are the settings I generally use when I start making a texture atlas. Now, if I'm making one for a bigger scene where I want to do a test environment, as in cram as much data into a single texture as possible, then I might go ahead and create a 2K one. And I'm going to show you one of those in a bit. And when making a texture analysis, it's actually really easy. All we do is we find the textures we want, we drag and drop them in, and we're sorted. But before we do that, let's just take a quick look at how I went about setting up this grid. So to do this, in Windows, you go to Edit, Preferences, Guides, Grid, and Slices. If you're on a Mac, then the option will be under the Photoshop uh, Preferences button, I think it is. And yeah, we go here and we get this little grid menu and what we want to do is make sure we've got it set to a nice vibrant color such as green I believe by default it's set to light grey and or light blue one of those and it's just a little too hard to see next thing you want to do is set it to something like 256 or 128 and set it to pixels instead of inches because then it's always going to be set to pixels no matter what your DPI of your image is set to and subdivisions control the subdivision so I can set this to something like 4 and you can see I get 4 divisions along there 2, I get 2, 1, I get 1 and that's simply how this works it's uh, quite good like that so we'll just click OK and that's our grids and if we just bring up my images here I've got a few images to bring in let's start with a nice brick texture so what we do is we drag and drop a grid texture in snap it to fit to a quarter is fine or however much you want it to take up and then we'll move on to the next one so I'll grab a nice sandy texture let's grab in a wooden texture now this one here, notice how it's not perfectly square but we'll just stretch it to make it square it's not a big stretch and that is fine I like to take up as much of my texture space as possible you could fill in the tiny little gap that it would leave but in all honesty a stretched texture is fine as long as it's not too stretched so basically we, what we can do is we can map a plane onto this and we know just to stretch the plane, plane a little or in the case like this then it's fine it's uh, not going to look bad you generally find most what textures won't look bad now for this fourth texture I'm going to grab a corrugated iron texture so I'm just going to these are all available on CG textures by the way paste that in there so I've got a section of it and now I'm just going to quickly go ahead and make it tileable first thing I noticed is that it ends on the same on both sides I can see that's not going to go tileable very well I'll demonstrate this for you if we filter offset you can see we get that line down there it's not what I want so let's just come in here go to our marquee select hold down shift to box select and by the way you can hold space bar to move your selection around I'm just going to line it up to a tip on that side and I'll line it to the other side on the other side of it right there we go so that's that's looking much nicer go filter other offset now I just want to offset on the horizontal and let's just find that seam I can see it running right down there so what I'm going to do is grab the client stamp grab a region such as over there and 
a little hard to spot which means I probably don't even need to do this but let's do that in the other axis as well horizontal to negative 248 just to put it back to where it was and vertical to let's say just a clone stamp works well just to fix up these kind of things all right filter other offset always put it back to where it was all right so with that there sorted we can come through and just close out that one paste it in here and just snap it in and then we have our very own little texture atlas and we can bring this into 3d map it onto textures and it will work very very nicely let's take a quick look at a slightly more advanced texture atlas okay so here we are now this you can see is a much larger texture atlas this one is actually a 2k texture atlas and this was for a project i did recently on creating a city and i was allowed to use two textures to create the city and the props with the exception of my road was allowed to have its own shaded network because that wasn't included but that was my task to do that and this was the atlas that i created so you can see i'll split these into modules i've got tile textures down here I've got the little roofing pieces over here doors and windows and all of this combined allows to make a nice little city and didn't honestly using this modular workflow it didn't take me very long to create the city so let's take a quick look here's the city that was created now you can see there is a few issues in the city but due to time constraints this was the result and yeah you can see all of these buildings were made with the same textures using vertex colors and yeah it's very easy to do it's uh you can see my road with the vertex blending that we talked about before all my props using the same texture and that's basically how the atlases work all right so that's talking about texturing first and that there was it's very good for beginners it's a good way to keep motivated while you're working because you can see how awesome your stuff is getting as you create it but it does get a little bit more difficult when you start creating technical stuff such as making a sci-fi modular hallway and you've got all those little wires and all those little details and texturing at first just generally isn't an option unless you've already got a greeble pack that's specific to your kind of environment so let's look at a new method called model first so this one here we start with the same process we'll analyze our research we sketch out some primitives and any repeated elements so that's where we go in and we figure out what the models are in the scene where we can repeat things and such like that then we go through and we block out the scene with some primitives we refine the block scene to resemble what we would like it to look like so similar to how you would imagine a previous environment as we're refining the geometry and scene what you do is you keep an eye out for where else it can be used so let's say you make a vent and you look somewhere else and like hey that paneling has a similar structure let's go use it over there and go through and fix any mesh problems that could have occurred uh, same thing happens where you could have some in interpenetration and such like that and the reason that's not particularly good is effectively you don't want any hidden faces because that's extra faces that aren't being useful and when we bake out things like lighting and ambient occlusion and such to our vertex colors it really does help to have them all lined up and nicely arranged and it works a lot better that way so then we go through and we make a folder with our textures we set up our document with the grids place out in our images and such and create normal specular maps and then of course we go through and assign them to our models and this is a bit better for experienced users users who have made a couple of game environments and they want to you know they want to make some more so they start with the modeling first so they know what they're creating and then they go through and add in the textures the reason I wouldn't recommend this for absolute beginners is because it is easy to get demotivated and it's really when you when you're starting out it's not about creating this amazing thing it's not about creating something that is perfect topology correct or anything like that it's about actually finishing something and being happy with it that is what it's about when you are just getting started
I mean, it is good to, you know, make all these awesome stuff, but I would recommend it as a, you know, a goal for a first user. We're going to take a vent, for example. Here's a simple low-poly vent that was modelled. And where else can we fit this in the scene? So we'll look around and maybe we'll look down the bottom and be like, hey, we've got these little uh, grills down the bottom. We can take that same vent, stretch it out, and fill it in there. And where else can we use it? Oh, look at this. We've got this uh, little module over here, and we've got these little vents up in the top. Now, I did actually use the exact same vent there, over here, and what I did is I actually beveled the edges to make it a circle. That works very well. By the way, if you were wondering how to do that, uh, in Blender, for example, you bevel the, you select all the edges around the sides, you get a bevel of 0.25 and then you could do another bevel of 0.25 and you'll get a nice even circle. So let's move on to a third process. This one here is called both methods in unison. Now this one here has the same sort of steps. We first analyze the research, we create a primitive sketch and decide on what textures we need. We create a texture atlas, we leave a little bit of room for some extra bits and you know we might want to put in some extra bits into it a little later. We then go through and block out our environment, refine our environment and adjust any textures or models to see what works best, sort of like previsioning the textures. So our model's built, it's constructed, looking cool and we're just seeing you know does this look better as a brick or would we prefer it as concrete. We then go through and check for any mesh errors, any interpenetration that could have occurred and then we go ahead and we recreate the texture atlas. So this one here is it's a little bit better for advanced users. So you've made a few environments and now you know what kind of textures you want to use in the environment so you create them, create your environment, then you basically scrap your textures and recreate them again. So you know what textures you've used, what you want to use, optimize that atlas if it's not already, and then remap everything. And this way works really well with getting a nice optimized environment. What should you do? What should you model first or should you texture first? Now they have a few different things that are good for each one. So the first one, when you create a texture atlas first and then you model to it, the pros are that you can see the final result as you go. The UV unwrapping is very easy. It's very optimized for exterior environments or environments without technical details. However, it can result in some mesh fixing such as flip normals and intersecting polygons and it can be a little tricky if you're working something a little more detailed. So the second method, create modular models and work with textures later. This one, you can have a clean, efficient mesh to start with. You can work with higher intensity details and it's very good at interior scenes, especially sci-fi. Now the cons are that it does require some technical UV mapping and you cannot see the final result while working. Now how about both? Both methods you can see the preview of the result as you go. It's good for pretty much any scene. You can have high or low intensity details as required and it is quite an efficient way to work. The cons is that it can result in some very messy mesh or textures if you're not sure what you're doing. And it is very difficult for beginners and can result in some abandoned projects. Which is really what you want to avoid as a beginner. So there we go. Beginner, intermediate and advanced. Now, do bear in mind that these are not locked in. These are simply my workflows that I have used and some others have used as I was learning off them. So this is what I'm showing you. You don't have to stick to it exactly. You can do some textures, you can model bits, then go back and do some more textures, finish up modeling. However way best works for you, that's the way that you should be working. But I simply want to convey my ideas, my techniques, and hopefully teach you guys a good bit along the way. So let's take a look at some efficiency tips. Now the first thing I really want to drill into you guys is plan your environment before you start. Right, make up a blueprint, make up um, a list of everything you need, get everything nutted down before you even start modeling, before you even jump into Blender or 3ds Max or Maya. You basically need to have everything sorted. Uh, when I'm creating an environment I have a I, I basically get a research folder set up. I might fill it up with about 300 
research images, I will pick say about 20 images, draw over them like we did before, say, you know, this is what I like about this image, this is what I don't like, um, I don't want to see this, you know, you know I don't, don't want to see these types of lines in this environment, but I really do like these textures, and I'll file that as such. I'll then go through and make a folder full of uh, textures, I might go about 30 different textures, be like, oh yep, these ones are good, and make an atlas like that. So the more you plan, the better it will be. If you don't plan, your environment basically can end up with no emotion, no connection to anything, or worst of all, especially for beginners, not finished. The other thing that you can do is use vertex colors to better reuse textures. Vertex colors, they have a low memory footprint and can be used to color your textures, fake shadows, lighting, ambient occlusion, or as we saw, we can even blend between two textures or four textures as we wish. And my final tip is always return to the viewer's angle. As you are modeling, if you're modeling a FPS, then go down to ground view. If you're modeling a top down, then switch up to top view. Your environment might look perfect from a bird's eye view, but that's not very useful for a first person shooter. Don't ruin your environment because it looks bad from an angle that will never be seen. And I have seen this happen before, where people will start detailing roofs and such, you know, putting boxes and stuff on the roofs because it didn't look good in their 3D app. Then they jump into Unity and effectively it just has all that extra stuff that is not being used. You can't even see it, but Unity is going to be rendering it anyway. And that's just having, it's just going to hammer down on your performance. So if you can't see it, don't worry about it. If it's messy mesh, don't worry about it. Although you shouldn't really have any mesh that won't be seen. All right. So, that concludes this theory lesson. So in this theory lesson we've uh, covered all you need to get started with modular environments. Now my challenge for you guys is to do a really really hard challenge for yourself. For example, set yourself a time limit of 6 hours, grab a photo and recreate it in a game environment using a single texture atlas. Now you can use a second one if you like with a alpha channel, so a diffuse texture atlas and a decal texture atlas. You know, just challenge yourself if however much you can get done in six hours, that's what you can get done. That is fine. Don't worry about perfecting an environment. Just block it out. Just get something working. The environment that I showed you a little earlier with the wasteland scene with the little towers and such, that one there, that was a six hour environment during a a presentation that I did earlier this year and yeah just challenging yourself like that it really does lock in how to create these modular environments so thank you for watching and you can visit our website www.unitycookie.com for more tutorials and resources we will also have up there the notes from this theory lecture and thank you for watching